Oh, see, now I wish you hadn't done that. All right, everybody stand back up. I'm not kidding. What do I got to do? Bang the pulpit? Everybody back up if you can. We haven't done this in a while. We still can't go running around shaking hands and giving everybody hugs, but we can still look and we can still wave. So here's what I want you to do. Look around at the people around you and around this church and make the biggest, cheesiest, goofy looking smile at them when you do it, all right? And you can say hi. Big, cheesy, goofy grins. Oh. You know, I broke my cuff link when I did that. Oh, that's disappointing. All right, you can be seated. Stand up again. So as you looked around the church with people that, that mostly are familiar to you, I think, um, we recognize just about everybody in here. When you looked around and saw them and you saw them smiling back at you, how'd you feel? Pretty good? Yeah. And when you looked around, what kinds of things did you notice maybe about everybody in here? Did you maybe notice what they were wearing? Maybe. Did you maybe notice on a subconscious level, that they looked similar to you in age, in race. This is not a sermon about racism. That's not where we're going with it. It's just pointing out that we feel really good a lot of times when we're looking around at people that we're comfortable with, that there's a lot of these similarities about their lives and our lives that makes us feel comfortable being around them. And I know from talking to a lot of you, if I was to ask you, how do you feel about the people in this church? When you see them, uh, do you have positive feelings about them? Do you you hope good things for them? Do you hope that they're growing in their Christian walk? Do you hope that their family life is going well? Of course, your answer for just about everybody in here is going to be, yeah, I want good things for them. That's good. That's as it should be. All right, now take that, put that over here. Now, let's change course. Think about watching TV. Anybody in here watch the news? Anybody in here read too much news online? I was thinking of you, Ed. You're welcome. Anybody here on Facebook? Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. Have you ever encountered any people on TV news or on the internet or on Facebook that you don't have such positive feelings about? It's an option. <laughs> They're out there, right? So when we see those people those people, we look out there and we start noticing all the things that are different about them from us, how they don't always look the same as us, how they maybe don't have the same politics as us. Whatever it is, we start noticing all those differences instead of all the thousands of things that we have in common with them too, not the least of which is the need for a Savior and the gospel. I think we can forget that all people, as they're going through life, share the same big questions about life and death and eternal life, the meaning of life, all those things. We don't all have the same resources sometimes to know where to go. We know as Christians, man, when we bump our heads into a brick wall that just doesn't seem to move, where do we go? We go to God in prayer. We go to His Word in the Bible. But there's a whole lot of people that don't have that, or at least don't have it yet. Some people 
actually have it figured out. God, Bible, yeah, we don't know the answers, but we go to him. There's a, a many people who think they have it figured out. And there is a whole bunch of people who don't have the slightest clue about any of it. And they don't even want to think about it. And even if they ever did, they wouldn't have the slightest idea where to turn to figure it all out. In an ideal world, for those people, a Christian friend or a family member would enter stage right, right there at that point in time in their life, and point them in the right direction. And they would listen because they'd seen the work of the Spirit evident in their friend's or their family member's life. And they would know that they are loved by them and that that person has their best interest at heart. In reality, sometimes we think and act like we're better than those who aren't Christians. That we've got it all figured out. We were smart enough and we were faithful enough for God to accept us. And it can be way too easy to start feeling self-righteous when we're in the in crowd. Now that we're in, I'm not sure anybody else deserves to get in. That's exactly what happened with God's chosen people, the Jews, and especially their religious leaders. And it can happen just as easily today in our churches. When we look out into the world around us and decide that those people who aren't believers, who are acting exactly like we would expect unbelievers to act, when we decide that somehow they're worthy only of judgment and punishment, and that they're unworthy of being pursued by the gospel message and by the church. Today's text, we're still continuing on in Matthew, is going to provide two things for us to combat those thoughts. It's going to give us a picture of faith in someone considered unworthy. And it's going to give us a picture of Jesus' missional heart. I probably should have promoted the title of this sermon a little bit more, especially as we're coming in from the outside in our parking lot services. I'm not above using cheap tactics to get some of you in here. Pictures of dogs, cuteness, yay. There we go. It just happened to work. A Messiah for the dogs. That's what we're talking about today. Starting in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, we're going to dive into our story now. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now we got to start connecting the dots here. We've, we've been going through a lot of stories lately. Jesus has been doing a lot of stuff. He goes into the region of Tyre and Sidon. This is important for the turn that we're taking in the narrative right now in Matthew. Up until this point in time, Jesus has been ministering. He's been doing these things in Jewish territory with Jewish audiences, or at least very predominantly Jewish audiences. Exorcisms, healings, you name it. That's what he's been doing. Now he leaves and he is in Gentile territory. This is the Canaanite region specifically. It's also important because the Canaanites are not only just the Gentiles, they are long-time enemies of the Jewish people. All right, so they're Gentile-y Gentiles. They're even more Gentile than normal Gentiles as far as the Jews are concerned. And you have this woman now. As you have the band of people, you have the disciples, you have the, the, the big D disciples and probably some other disciples following along. You have Jesus um, walking and talking with them. And you have this woman now who is following along behind them. And as they're walking and as they're talking, she's behind them screaming out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Now, while I can respect that message, if one of you was in here while I was preaching, screaming at me, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, as I'm trying to preach a sermon, I'd probably get pretty aggravated. You'd start to get annoyed. You can imagine 
how that would kind of upset the apple cart, so to speak. It would upset everybody's sensibilities, but that's what's going on. And she is wailing like only a mother can who was trying to do something for her daughter. She's desperate to do something for her daughter, and so she's not going to be shut up. That's not going to happen. He goes on, but he did not answer her with even a word. What? That's Jesus. He says, Jesus didn't answer her. She's crying out for mercy from Jesus, and he didn't even answer her. And his disciples came up and urged him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now you can understand, just as I would, if the disciples are aggravated with her here. And their message to Jesus is, Jesus, make her go away. Send her away. She's bothering us. And we notice that he may not have answered her immediately, but he doesn't send her away either. Given the context that's around this whole narrative, it's pretty plausible to imagine Jesus using this interruption as a teachable moment with his disciples. And I want you to to picture him really throughout this whole exchange with her as plucking out some of that um, conventional wisdom that he's been bucking up against to this point. The Jewish conventional wisdom. Hey, You know, if you want to be righteous, wash your hands to get that ceremonial impurity off. And Jesus says, no, it's your heart that matters, the cleanliness of your heart. He's he's going back up against that tradition and that teaching of the elders and the religious leaders and all those kinds of things. And so he's going to pluck out a couple more of those truths that he wants to shed some light on here. What do the Jews think about the Gentiles? The Messiah is only going to be sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do we really think that Jesus believes that? I hope not. So he's turning all this stuff upside down. He's restoring the rightful place of God's word over the tradition of the elders. Now... He's turning the expectations, the Jewish expectations of God's plan upside down as well. He's flipping them over on their head. It's probably best to understand even the disciples' plea here to send her away as send her away with her needs met. Like, just do what she wants and get her out of here. And so Jesus responds by using this teachable moment to say, what do you mean send her away with her needs met? Don't we believe that the Messiah was sent to the lost sheep of Israel? (laughs) The answer to that rhetorical, non-rhetorical question is, yeah, they did. (laughs) But no, they shouldn't. So he says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But this Canaanite woman, as we've already discovered, is just not going to be deterred. She is a mother. And she is a desperate mother. Verse 25, but she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. Yet he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. There is definitely a sense in Christ's ministry that he came first to the Jews, that he came primarily to the Jews. But Christ's mission would be for more than the Jews. And this is the the first big hint that we have of it, is the fact that he is venturing out to do some of these things in Gentile territory. So he's going out there, but this is his response now. It's not good, it's not proper to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Does anybody else cringe when they hear Jesus say that to a a mother in distress? This is a verse that theologians and commentary writers and everything have struggled over for centuries. How do we read this? This doesn't match 
if we read it plainly with what we know of Jesus, with what we know of his mercy and his compassion, uh, the way that he has been healing and, and providing for people in need. And yet here he is saying, it's not good for me to give the stuff for the Jews to Gentile dogs. That should sit poorly with you. I think there's a good reason for that. The word that's used for dogs, as we kind of, again, keep working through this, there was a pariah dog that was common in that part of the world, still is, actually. It's pretty much just a, I don't know, another word for a, a stray dog that runs around and scavenges and does whatever, like they're just nasty little dogs running around the streets doing all this stuff. That is not the word that is used here. The word that's used for dogs here by Jesus is actually, in, in language terms, is called a diminutive. It's almost a term of endearment. It is talking about more of the, the little dogs, the family dogs, the, the dog that the little children would play with under the table. It's that dog. So it's almost a term of endearment that he's using when he says dogs. And I think Jesus is clarifying for them exactly what we've known since Genesis, what John pulls out in John 4.22 as well. Salvation is from the Jews. That's why Jesus is spending so much time through the Jews. Jesus is Jewish himself. The disciples, a lot of them are Jewish. They're, they're learning from him, growing from him, becoming his disciples. But the plan was always for the rest of the world to be reached through the Jewish people. Not for the Jewish people to be the end-all, be-all of God's people. So he's phrasing these questions in such a way as to ask the disciples to get them thinking, could the Messiah possibly be for the Gentiles as well? Could he possibly be for the Gentiles as well? Here we've been thinking, the Messiah is coming for the Jews. He's coming for the Jewish people, for the lost sheep of the children of, of the, the country of Israel. Militarily, politically, he's coming for us. Man, it's going to be awesome for us when the Messiah comes back. Could he possibly be for the Gentiles too? Like the Canaanites, a lot of them are our enemies. He's coming for them too? And so we have a picture in Matthew of a Gentile, a Canaanite woman, an enemy of the Jews culturally, and what is she doing? She is bowing down and worshiping Jesus. I skipped right over it up above. What did she call him? Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. She's not even a Jew. And she recognizes that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Jewish religious leadership doesn't recognize that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Many of the Jewish people don't recognize that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Here is an enemy Canaanite Gentile woman throwing herself at his feet, worshiping him because she knows he is the Messiah. Is Jesus really calling Gentiles? And even this Gentile woman in front of him, dogs. We touched on it that it's diminutive. And I think it's a little bit of conjecture. We have a tendency to read too blandly sometimes. When we read the Bible, we just kind of read it. Jesus went away from there and went through into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. 
okay. We already talked about the fact that this woman is screaming. She's desperate. She's a mother. There's more to it than just reading that. Same thing now when it comes to Jesus calling supposedly Gentiles dogs. And if we just read it as plainly as we read it, and we do the same thing with Jesus over and over again to our own loss, I think, we miss so much of the depth of what Jesus is trying to say, but also his sense of humor. We miss uh, some of the points that he's trying to make um, because we're, we're just reading it too straight. We miss his playfulness and how he deals with people. Um, and we're not wrong to insist that Jesus is normally very compassionate in these kinds of circumstances. I think what he's really doing is trying to coax out of her this expression of faith that he's looking for and that she is engaged in. He's pulling that out of her. When we read the text, we can read exactly what somebody says, but we can't read how they say it. If you can imagine Jesus in this exchange, you know, the disciples are there, they're crowded around, they're, you know, wanting her to go away, they're annoyed, they're whatever. But if you can imagine Jesus now making eye contact with that woman, now it's a conversation between him and her. Even if he's not speaking directly to her yet, he could be looking at her and speaking for everybody else's benefit and for her. And you can imagine a little twinkle in his eye when he says what he says to her as they're talking. It's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Something in what he said let her know it's not time to walk away. It's time to press the point in faith. If he had just called her a dog, it would have been as rude back then as it is to do it now. She would have gotten the impression that she was unwelcome and there was nothing for her there and she would have left. Yet something, something pushed her along to keep pressing in faith. And she said, yes, Lord, but please help me for even the dogs feed on the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed at once. Do you know that this Canaanite woman is one of only two people in Matthew's gospel that Matthew notes Jesus commends them for their faith? A Canaanite woman. You know who the second one is? We've already passed it. The centurion. Another Gentile. Two Gentiles were the people commended for their faith in Matthew's gospel by Jesus. This is the type of faith that is commended to all believers. Like Peter walking on water when he was focused on Jesus. This woman refused to leave Jesus until she got what she knew only he could provide. That is faith. That's the kind of faith that Jesus tells believers is always answered. John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's what she's doing. And we're actually not going to go into detail on the, the verses that come after it, but I want to just give you a quick summary of them um, before we kind of hit the application side of things here. Verses 29 through 31, it gives us this, this kind of very broad general description of Jesus going on into the Gentile territory to give, uh, to perform more of these miracles, exorcisms, all these things that he's been doing in Jewish land. He's going to go on and do them in this Gentile area. And then in verses 32 through 39, Jesus is going to feed 4,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fishes. Sound familiar? That's not why I'm going to go through it in detail again. There's some different details in it. It's essentially the same story with the really, really big difference of it's Gentiles and not just Jews. It's Gentiles. That's the point. Jesus is doing these things. He is ministering to Gentiles. Verses 
even when it comes to it, one of the things in that feeding of the 4,000 Gentiles that always stood out to me was the fact that it's the same situation. The people are there. They're hungry. They're ready to go. And the disciples are like, hey, going to send them away? And Jesus is like, I want to feed them. What do we got? And you can almost imagine the, the disciples then sitting there going, is Jesus, is he really going to do the same thing he's already done for the Gentiles? Is he really going to do this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he really did do that. So lots of teaching opportunities for them. He is concerned. Jesus is concerned. The disciples, even in this story, aren't yet concerned with providing for the Gentiles. Jesus is. That's his heart. Jews at the time felt superior to Gentiles. Uh, the, the belief absolutely was that the Messiah was for the Jews. The Gentile dogs were unworthy and despite the vast majority of Jesus' ministry uh, being focused on the Jews, he is showing very, very clearly here in this whole passage that his mission is much broader. It is to the Gentiles too, and by extension, to the whole world. These are the types of experiences, I think, that men like Peter would remember later on as God showed them not to call common what he had made clean. I think... Peter would have thought back to these things. The harvest fields are ripe, even in the Gentile lands. Jews don't have the market cornered on faith. This Canaanite woman very clearly shows that. Jesus is able to meet the greatest needs of all people. And he is making clear that he came to serve, satisfy, and save people from every nation. If I could pull just one word of application out of this whole passage to share with you guys this morning, it would just be to encourage you to have the same kind of faith that that Canaanite woman had. That faith that just says, I'm not going to let go until I get what I need from Christ. I'm not going to go try to find it somewhere else. I'm not going to get sidetracked and get lost. I am just going to cling to the feet of Christ until I get what I need from Christ. That's faith. Whatever it is in your life right now that is pulling you down, holding you down, beating you up, making you confused, giving you brain fog, whatever the case is, just hold on to Christ. Hold on. Spend time in your Bible learning about him. Spend time in prayer talking to him. But hold on. The big things in life, there's nowhere else to get what you need except Christ. Hold on to him. But, if I could pull out a second word of application from this passage to share with you, and I can because I'm the preacher, and if you guys get up right now and walk out, it'll look really rude on your part, so you have to listen. Second word of application, it would have to be about having God's missional heart for the lost. Jesus didn't just come to save the quote-unquote chosen people. And he didn't just come to save the good churchy church people either. Jesus is the Messiah for the Jews and the Gentiles, for the children and the dogs. Thank God he does not see people with the same distinctions and prejudices that we do. Do you ever see those unbelievers as the enemy? I know I do, far too often. It is so easy when we run up against it just to get angry, just to want them to be punished want something to happen to them, to want them to go away. Whatever the case is, it's so easy to do that. But when we realize that all of us were enemies of God and Christ came running to us, then we know where our hearts need to be. That's the missional heart that he has. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that those who don't know it and don't know him can come to know him the way that you have. That they can come to be saved the way that you are. And the big picture, if Jesus had only come 
for the Jews, you and I, brothers and sisters, would still be lost and dead in our sins. You are proof that God's mission included Gentiles, people from all over the world, all backgrounds, all ethnicities. Our country didn't even exist when Jesus came. Yet he came for us too. We're Gentiles. We, we are the dogs in this story. That's why I felt okay calling the title of the sermon, Messiah for the Dogs. We're the dogs in this passage. And when I look back over my life, even more than just being a Gentile, when I look at how I lived before knowing Christ, man, being called a dog hits really close to home in a lot of ways. But Jesus is the Messiah for the dogs. You're called to pursue others now in the same way that Jesus pursued you. Not because you have to check another box to be accepted by God or by his people, but just out of thankfulness for your salvation, for the forgiveness that you've received through Jesus already in your life. The world and its pretender prince seek to divide. That is all we hear anymore. Black versus white. Rich versus poor. Vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's all efforts to tear people apart and make us focus on everything that is different about us instead of the important things that are the same. And as Christians, the thing that is the same about everybody, everybody, that we were sinners in need of a Savior. Plain and simple. Sinners in need of a Savior. If you found the Savior, share him with somebody else because they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, just like he does here, he doesn't tear apart and he doesn't destroy. He seeks to bring people together in himself, to unite them together in him. As a family, God's children, Christ's church, he brings people together. You're called to pursue others that the world, that our society, and yes, sometimes even the church, have written off as not being worth the effort or trouble. That's who we're called to reach. Jesus thought they were worth the effort. He thought they were worth dying for. Even when you were a sinner, an enemy of God, Jesus came for you and died for you. You're called to pursue others recklessly and without regard to any differences between you and them because the bigger picture is that you were once as dead and lost in your sins as they still are. God's heart is to pursue the lost no matter what the cost is. Even with dogs, there's room for Jesus' love and a need for that gospel message. And he wants his people to live on mission in the same way. That is our calling every day of our lives, no matter what we're engaging in. It doesn't matter if we're sitting in here. It's, it's easier to make Jesus the focus as we're sitting in here, as it should be. Even if you're at work, Living for Christ should animate what you do. It should animate the conversations you have with your coworkers. Even if you're at school, it should animate the conversations you have with your classmates. Even if you're on vacation, where the temptation is to leave your Christianity behind sometimes, you're still on mission. And you don't get to retire from it either. There's no aging out of this mission. There's no walking away from the mission field. You're always on it. And just as Jesus went into pagan territory, we're called to go there too. And it absolutely might make us uncomfortable. And it absolutely might make us unpopular. It might draw ridicule for putting Christ's mission ahead of what the world values. But it should absolutely change how we live our lives, always with an eye on God's kingdom. May we continue as a church and as individuals, to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the poor, abused, 
downtrodden, helpless, hopeless sinners around the world and in our own community. And may we never hold ourselves up as better than others, but recognize that we all share that same need for a Savior. We, as his church, are called to continue that mission, either until he returns or until he calls us home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful picture of what it means to cling to you in faith. Father, to fall down at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus, and cry out in desperation for what only he can give, the forgiveness, the reconciliation, the restoration that we all need. And Father, for those who have done that, who have repented of their sins and given their lives to Jesus Christ and are living in obedience, Lord, just help us to always remember our thankfulness of having your grace poured out on us the way that you have. Father, we just pray that we would see those opportunities that you put in front of us every day to engage with the world for the sake of the gospel. Father, to reach some lost soul that is walking in darkness with the light of Jesus Christ, to show them a little love and point them back to Him. Lord, help us to be a church that is about the mission of Jesus Christ and reaching those lost souls. Father, we know the harvest is ready. We are always in need of workers. I pray that this church would raise their hands and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Lord, as we're about to sing another song in glory and honor to you, just help us to honestly Search our own hearts for those things, those prejudices, whatever they are that are holding us back from wholeheartedly serving you. Father, bring them out of us. Renew in us a clean heart. Father, light a fire up under us for that mission. Whatever it is this morning, brothers and sisters, that is holding you back, I pray that you would bring it forward, that you would place it up here on the altar, that you would give it to God and leave it there. We should always be rededicating our lives to serving Him. Today is no different. He will give you everything you need, the strength, the power, the discernment, the wisdom, whatever it is, He will give it to you when you seek Him. So now as we sing, this altar is open. It's open so that you can speak with God, so that you can renew your service and obedience to Him. Father, we thank you for the privilege. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.